works, the, fun, the fundamental method of the discipline that was created in the wake of this marginalist turn of the 19th century is the creation of models, the production of models in mathematical language against the background of a very special kind of theory. So I have to say something about the fundamental nature of the theory. The marginalists understood the economy as a series of connected markets. Uh, the fundamental operation is the choice of comparative ways to satisfy desires or goals against the background of the constraint of scarcity in competitive or relatively competitive markets. Uh, as if the main task of economics were the explanation of relative prices. Although this method has never actually explained relative prices in any real economy. So that's the background, the fundamental nature of the theory. This theory, as the Austrian economists who were among the main formulators and defenders of it perceived, was not really a causal science at all. It was closer to logic than to causal explanation. And in its purest form, uh, it was analytically rigorous, but empty. It was a form of deductive reasoning. Uh, so it creates an analytic apparatus that is innocent of factual stipulations, causal conjectures, or normative commitments. It's a machine, and a logic machine. And the gas has to be supplied from the outside. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't work. So when it is rigorous, it is empty. And when it has internal content, the internal content has to be somehow smuggled into it, and it becomes impure. It's either impure and corrupted intellectually and potent, or it is rigorous and pure, but impotent. Uh, now, so that's the, that's the background, the analytical background. Then the main activity of the economist in this tradition is to formulate different models, which are stylized accounts of a part of economic reality against this undisputed theoretical background. So if a model doesn't work, they change the model by introducing new elements into it or altering the values of the elements. It's like Groucho Marx said, I have principles. And if you don't like them, I have other ones. Uh, so uh, this is widely regarded as an advantage because it makes the background theory invulnerable. Something doesn't work, you replace the model. But of course, it's not an advantage, it's a condemnation. And it risks condemning economics to an eternal infancy because it lacks this vital dialectic between theory and fact, empiricism. There is a great deal of theory and there is plentiful empiricism, but they have very little to do with each other in the science or the pseudoscience that resulted from this marginalist turn of the late 19th century. So that I would say is the fundamental problem with the economics that resulted from this revolution. There have been many other projects in economics. For example, Alfred Marshall, who wrote and thought in England at the same time of this marginalist revolution, proposed that economics should be developed by the methods of natural history. It should be a context-dependent causal science, like the science of the tides or of the weather. But that's not what, on the whole, it became. 
So that is, that is the fundamental character of this method. And to understand it fully, we have to take that as just the first of a series of flaws. Because there are three other flaws that follow on that fundamental one. So the second flaw has to do with the deficit of institutional imagination in the economics that resulted from the marginalist term. And particularly institutional imagination with respect to the institutions of the market order itself. So from the standpoint of institutions, you could say there have been three main types of economics. First, there's pure economics, which has no institutional assumptions. It's, as I said, a kind of logical apparatus. And as was demonstrated in the mid 20th century, it can be applied even to a command economy, a socialist economy. Uh, it's innocent. This is, so the, 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 the purists have as their ethic, the ethic of Pontius Pilate. My hands are clean. I have, make no commitments. My only commitment is to logical rigor. And of course, this helps explain a peculiarity of this economics, which is that it worships mathematics, but employs only primitive mathematics the mathematics developed before the middle of the 19th century because no other mathematics is of any use for deductive reasoning, which is uh, what it mainly does, as opposed to the use of mathematics and contemporary physics to explore complicated and paradoxical types of connections in nature. So, and then there's a second kind of economics which you could call fundamentalist economics with respect to institutions. So uh, it, it identifies the abstract notion of the market with a particular set of economic institutions. Uh, and this is the belief of the vulgar economists that a market is a market, property is property, contract is contract. Everyone knows what they are. In fact, the jurist demonstrated over 150 years that the market has no natural form and it can be organized in radically different ways. So in this fundamentalist tradition, we have, for example, the school of Friedrich Hayek. And its assumption is that if Robinson Crusoe tra traded long enough on his island, he would eventually reproduce spontaneously the whole system of German private law because it's intrinsic to the nature of the market. And then there's a third kind of economics with respect to institutions, which you could call equivocating economics, in which exemplified by the practice of the so-called macroeconomists, who are the American followers of Keynes, who reduced his teachings to the theory of fiscal and monetary policy. So there the idea is there are law-like relations between large-scale economic aggregates, like the level of, of uh, employment and of inflation, Phillips curve as it's called. And uh, if you challenge them, you can say, well, these so-called laws depend on a host of detailed institutional arrangements. For example, whether there's unemployment insurance or how labor is organized or how, who has power over monetary policy and so forth. And then the macrocons will concede that that's true. But if he is in a situation in which de facto there is institutional stagnation, he will disregard this concession, this pro forma concession, and go back to what he was doing before, which was the, the exploration of these pseudo laws. Huh? Uh, so this is the second defect. The third defect of the economics that resulted from marginalism is that it has no view of production. So it views the economy solely as a system of exchange uh, mediated through the price system. This wasn't true of the economics that existed before marginalism. For the two greatest economic thinkers previous, 
Karl, Karl Marx and Adam Smith, the theory of production was of equal weight to the theory of exchange. But the economists came to think of the world of production as a shadowy extension of the system of exchange. And so if you open an economics textbook and look at the chapter called The Theory of Production, you'll find that there's almost nothing in it about what we would call production. It's about the substitution of factors or the shape of markets. And this is facilitated because in these economies that they study, labor can be brought and, bought and sold and therefore viewed under the lens of relative prices. Uh, the fourth defect of this economics that resulted from the marginalist turn is that it is the theory of a method of competitive selection bereft of any account of the diversification of the material on which competitive selection operates. So it's as if it were the neo-Darwinian synthesis in the life sciences without the second half. So there's the half about competitive selection, but where's the other half about genetic mutation and becoming, and that doesn't exist. And that's a problem because the fecundity of a method of competitive selection depends on the richness of the material from which it selects. So this is like the truncated half version of some undeveloped theory. Now, you'll notice that this is a pretty obvious account of these flaws, but it, it's, it's not part of the debate because the, uh, the general public, the complainers, the hostile but confused enemies of economics can only think to say uh, that the assumptions are not realistic, uh, real people are not these economic automatons and so forth. They don't understand what the method was supposed to be. And so the economists can dismiss these complaints that arise from ignorance and confusion. And the real flaws in their pseudoscience are never exposed. Uh, they're, as it were, secrets, uh, the secrets of this intellectual empire. Uh, and that helps explain this somewhat disastrous situation in which the, the discipline that has the greatest influence and authority among the social sciences should rest on such fragile foundations.